welcome to this session where we uh, have the pleasure of joining in conversation with Dr. Kari Gislason, who I'll introduce in a moment. I'm Rod Welford. I'm a former Arts Minister and it's great to come home here to uh, the State Library of Queensland for this year's Ideas Festival. I've been retired from Parliament for a couple of years now, so it's great to relax and enjoy the Ideas Festival uh, once and for uh, at this time, rather than having to uh, be too busy to attend it in the other years that it was uh, held. And there's a fabulous lineup of uh, speakers and events throughout this festival, uh, and I hope you enjoy it. This morning, we're vodcasting uh, these, these presentations and the conversations you'll have with Kari, so feel free to uh, energetically participate in our discussion after he does his presentation. Well, is there a geography of happiness? What is it about going home that makes us feel that warm inner glow? Is there something about the happiness that comes with our experience of particular places? Not just the place we might call home, but you think back to those times where you've been somewhere and it's been memorable and it's made you feel good. I had an experience like that and it had nothing to do with home. Although we all know that if you go back to the street in which you grew up to see the family home, there's something about the connection you have with that place, isn't there? A few years ago, <coughs> I went on holidays and I was in Europe. I celebrated my birthday in Monte Carlo and we then drove, uh, headed north into the countryside in the hills of southern France on the way to Paris. We stopped overnight in this little village it had one hotel, uh, one restaurant, a couple of shops and about 20 houses. And the only thing that went through there apart from the occasional tourist like us was uh, the bus between Nice and Paris. I woke up in the morning, brisk, on the edge of winter in southern France and looked up into the rugged, rocky <coughs> outcrops of uh, the nearby mountainside. And I had what you might call one of those eureka moments, one of those epiphanies, uh, where it made me realise that there's this whole other world out here. Um, and yet most of my life was embedded in the narrow focus of my work at that time uh, and that dreaded asylum at the other end of George Street. Uh, and it made me realise that, you know, there's just something special about those moments in places that are special. You've probably had that experience too, and we'll have the opportunity to share those experiences after we hear from, hear from Carrie in a moment. Travel's always been uh, uh, of interest to Carrie. He was born in Iceland, uh, but came to Australia as a young child. But since then, as uh, a writer, teacher and lecturer, he's been very active in travel writing. And he's got a strong interest in writing about places, experiences, um, and travel generally. He's been a travel writer who's been published in literary uh, journals as well as in the mainstream press. He's written a book called The Promise of Iceland, um, which follows his returns to Iceland and is described as a lyrical and deeply personal reflection on fatherhood, travel and his homeland. He's currently uh, a lecturer uh, in creative writing at uh, QUT and he's got a chapter in a forthcoming Cambridge, book, uh, Cambridge University Press book, I presume, The Companion to Creative Writing. He's also got a travel and writing blog, so after your uh, get a taste of his uh, nourishing ideas today, you might want to follow his blog. Will you please welcome Carrie Gis Larson. Thank you very much for an interesting um, introduction and, and uh, a good one for me because it's, it signals in a sense the way I'm going to approach this topic today, which is I'd like to talk about returning and the idea of home uh, from, a, from a fairly personal point of view. Uh, I'd like to use my own story 
uh, about my returns to Iceland to raise uh, this question about what is home? Uh, how do we define home and how do we define our relationship to the to a kind of point of origin or perhaps as I'll, I'll move towards uh, in this discussion towards a point of return, uh, the sense of, or of origin and return. And I want to talk about my own experiences um, as, a, as a kind of Iceland tragic um, in, that, in that process, in, in defining what it means to go back and how you know when you're back. Um, I'd like to start with, with just a little bit of information uh, about Iceland. Um, I assume that you, you know a little bit about the place uh, if you're here today. It's a, it's a remote island in the North Atlantic. It has 300,000 inhabitants. So in other words, everybody in Iceland uh, knows everybody else's business. It's that kind of place where you can't be known. And in fact, one of the great pleasures of being in Iceland is the sense that everybody is following what you're doing all the time. And, and that, that is one of the defining qualities of going back. As soon as you get back to Iceland, there's this kind of fuss made about the fact that you're there uh, and that you exist and that you could be bothered coming back. Uh, and one of the, on one of the trips that I made back, I, I was interviewed for the, the newspaper, the main newspaper. I was interviewed for the local rag, and I was interviewed on a couple of uh, TV channels. And the story was simply, he's back. Uh, you know, there was, there was no other angle. I hadn't actually done anything since I'd been away. It was just the fact that I'd come back that was enough. Um, and it tells you a little bit about how Icelanders are. Uh, they're extremely concerned with each other and with themselves. It's a country of self-occupation. Uh, having said that, it's not provincial. Uh, it's not inward looking to the point where Icelanders don't care about anything else. And like Australians, one of the best qualities of Icelanders is the desire to leave. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of come out not quite the way I intended. Uh, but Australians are like that, aren't they? I mean, Australians uh, tend to know that it's important to get away. Uh, and that getting away is part of how you understand Australia. And you don't really understand this place until you leave. Uh, and, and also that, that being on an island creates that impulse or that necessity. Um, I think that when you are constantly facing the ocean, uh, perhaps the most natural thing in the world to do is to want to get in. And that's, I think, what Australians do, and I think that's what Icelanders do as well. They leave. Uh, Iceland itself... Is a, is a country of exiles. But here I'm talking metaphorically and going back some 1,100 years. The, the, the place was settled by Norwegians um, in, in the 9th century, uh, Vikings. Um, the recent DNA studies that have been done in Iceland reveal that they weren't all Norwegians. Um, the, the, the female line appears to be dominated by Irish and Scottish and English women. So what, it, what, what it appears to have happened is that the Norsemen left Bergen, and then stopped on the way um, uh, in, in Scotland, Ireland, or Wales, um, got a kind of takeaway pack uh, <laughs> in, in the various raids that they were doing, and took the women to Iceland with them. And that's why in Iceland we have quite a lot of uh, red-headed uh, people. You know, it's not, going to Iceland is not like going to Norway where everyone's tall and blonde. It's, it's a much different looking people. And these people left Norway um, because of a certain Harald the Haurfagr, or Harold the Fairhaired. Um, Harold the Fairhaired only became known as Harold the Fairhaired towards the end of his career. Up until, up until uh, quite late, he was called Harold the Shaggy. Uh, and the reason he was called Harold the Shaggy was because he wouldn't cut his hair until he unified Norway. And then when he finally had unified Norway, he called himself Harold the Fairhaired because he'd had a haircut. Uh, now, Harold the Fairhaired was a rather sort of despotic leader, and he caused the, 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 the more valiant and independent-minded Norsemen to leave. And uh, in their search for places, they, they found Iceland. And so Iceland has this sense of itself as a place of noble exile. It was the people in Norway who weren't going to tolerate a unified ruler uh, who went to Iceland to reclaim the virtues of small uh, chieftain-based provincial government, if you like. This idea of a kind of a more independent spirited system. And that ethos is still the defining ethos in Iceland. The idea in Iceland is that you do what you want. No one can ever stop you being independent. And, and the, the, the landmark text, you know, our kind of, um, I say, our, the Icelandic uh, uber novel is called Independent People. Uh, the dominant political party of the 20th century was called the Independence Party. And the most popular TV show, the sort of Australian story of 
of Icelanders called independent people. This idea of independence and separateness is the crucial defining kind of myth of Icelandic settlement, and it runs through to today, and it runs through in the way Iceland sees itself globally. Um, Icelanders think of Iceland as the island apart, the place that's a little bit separate from the rest of Europe. And if, you, if, you're, if you've been wondering about this whole ice save business and the, the financial scandals of the last sort of two or three years, if you think of Iceland in this way, as a country that's always seen itself as separate and in a way having a sort of tangential relation to Europe, I think you start to understand how that ice save business kind of came about, that Icelanders could just do what they wanted. And if you put your money in our accounts, well, that's your problem. If you lose your savings, well, you shouldn't have put your money there. You know, that, that kind of thing. <laughs> so when we talk about Iceland, we're talking about this country on the edge of Europe um, that as a place is about returns. It's about exile and return. It's about the people who left Norway in order to find something new. And that's always a, a core feature of travelling, isn't it? This idea that you can find something different somewhere else. It's about a place that's on the edge of Europe and a place that sits on a tectonic rift between America and, and, and Europe, and which is always growing. Iceland, this is a, one of those sort of trivia questions, Iceland grows by 10 centimetres a year uh, in the middle. So it, it pushes out 10 centimetres a year as those two plates separate. Uh, and so even Iceland itself is being pushed apart. And the, the national symbol, where the site of the first parliament in Iceland, uh, which is called Thingvellir, and which I'll come back to a few times, is on that rift. So the very symbol of Icelandic unity and parliamentary uh, democracy, it's the oldest modern parliament in Europe, is on a rift. Uh, it's pulling itself apart. So this idea of separateness and togetherness is, is really at the, at the core of Icelandic uh, identity and at the core of my story as well. Uh, my story about going back is, is touching on those very things. The last thing I want to sort of raise as, as an introductory idea is the idea of the Icelandic sagas. Um, the, the Norsemen who came to Iceland uh, were, were literate. Uh, to begin with, uh, there was a strong oral tradition of stories, Viking stories, and eventually these came to be written down. And in the 12 and 1300s, Iceland, for, for reasons we don't really understand, became one of the most literate communities in the world. And it was the Icelanders who recorded the, the histories of the kings of Norway, Denmark, and Sweden. Most famous of these was a guy called Snorri Sturluson, and he wrote Heimskringla, which is our, really our main source of Scandinavian history from the medieval period. So stories have always been a kind of core feature of Icelandic life, and Iceland's still a very literate place. Everyone's a poet in their spare time. You're either a poet or a philosopher, and of course you don't show that ever until around midnight when you've drunk enough vodka, and then you display, you know, then you start talking Nietzsche to the farmer. It's that kind of thing, uh, that everything's buried six feet down, but it's very deep. You know, once you get there, it's deep. This is another photograph of Thing that Live. In the left-hand corner of the picture, you can see a flagpole, and that's where they think that the uh, parliament was held the original Icelandic parliament, which was, which was started in 930. It was an outdoor parliament. It was held for two weeks in high summer. And the whole country would gather there for a, a discussion of, of legal issues, for court cases, but also um, for matchmaking. Uh, this is where you came to find someone, to, to fall in love. And if you walk through Thing That Live, you, you find lots of places where that could have happened. It's a, it's a, it's a valley and a, a, a series of gorges where there's plenty of pockets uh, for couples to meet. And one of the, uh, the most famous couples to meet there is a, is a guy called Gunnar. Um, and, his, uh, and the girl he met was called Halge. And I'll just tell you a little bit about their story while I'm telling my own. Excuse me. Uh, Gunnar was the, by far the most brave and perfect warrior in Iceland. Uh, he had uh, flaxen hair, uh, long flaxen hair. He had a straight nose that was tipped at the end. Uh, he had strong square jaw. He was tall. He could swim like a seal. He could jump as far forwards as he could backwards, uh, which I think is a strange thing to be able to do. He was able to, he was able to jump onto a horse using his, his, his axe. Other Vikings just got on their horses. <laughs> uh, but Gunnar thought it was necessary to kind of lift himself up. Um, when he went to Norway, he was a great success, and he came back with all kinds of fine things. 
He was a desirable guy. Um, at that same old thing was a, was a young woman called Halgeth. Halgeth Longlegs was her nickname. And she was uh, famous for her trousers. Uh, she wore long trousers. Um, she had very long hair. She was extremely beautiful, but she was a little bit of trouble. She'd caused the death of her first two husbands, which in most societies is a problem. But in Iceland, it wasn't such a big deal, but it was a definite drawback. <laughs> um, Gunnar is a very proud man, and he meets Halgeth, and instantly there's a sexual connection. They, they understand each other. And Gunnar um, says to her, oh, hello, would you like to sit down? And they sit down in one of these areas that I mentioned before. And they start talking, and, and Halke says, where have you been? And he says, I've been to Norway. And she says, tell me some of the things you did. So like, a, like any kind of uh, intelligent woman, she knows how to draw out the, the wonderful experiences of the men and to sound interested while he tells her. And so he begins telling her about these Norwegian, Norwegian experiences. And then finally he says to her, are you married, Halke? And she says, you can't possibly be interested in that. Uh, and he says, but what if I am? And then she says, well, you'd better go and speak to my father and my uncle. And off he goes and talks to them, and they try and stop him. They, think, they say to him, Gunnar, you're a good man. Don't go anywhere near Halgeth. Um, <laughs> so this is her father and her, her uncle telling him this, but he refuses uh, to accept this good advice, and they, they marry. And they go back to his farm in southern Iceland, which is just really a uh, stone's throw away from where that volcano was, Eyjafjallajökull. Um, his farm is called Hlíðarendin. It means the end of the slope. It's a beautiful farm that sits on the end of a, of a kind of gentle slope running down from, from one of the mountain ranges there in the south. And that's the start of our story, these two characters who fall in love, who marry despite the advice of their good friends. The sagas are kind of defining documents in the Icelandic imagination. Um, this is one of my favourite uh, photographs uh, from... Um, from the Icelandic sort of 20th century, that Danish frigate is bringing home a saga. It's bringing it back from Denmark. It was given, the most of the saga manuscripts were given to the Danes during the colonial period when Iceland uh, was trying to always impress its Danish rulers. And during the Icelandic struggle for independence in the middle of the, particularly towards the middle of the, of the last century, um, the Danes agreed to give them all back or most of them, the most important ones. And people often say that Iceland has forgiven Denmark for hundreds of years of or, or unpleasant rule because of this moment when they decided that they would return the manuscripts. And look at the crowd. This is at a, this is at a time in Iceland's life when the population was about 150,000 people. And tens of thousands of people came to witness the return of an old piece of vellum, an old piece of calf skin with these stories on it, <coughs> including the Saga, the story I'm quoting from. So this idea of stories coming home and the, the way that stories allow you to come home, the way that you can return to a kind of former version of yourself through storytelling, is one of the things that I'm interested in. I'm interested in what stories do and how they let you see things differently. The story I'm telling uh, at the same time, I have a few strands going here, uh, is the story of my mother, uh, Susan. My mother was born in, in England in, in 1941 during the war, and she grew up close to one of the uh, bombing, close to one of the uh, RAF uh, bases, and her, her early years were, uh, were, were, were terrified years in a way. She, she grew up to the sound of, of bombing raids. Her father, Harold, who's in the left-hand picture there, was in the war and was present at the liberation of Paris. Uh, he, he had a, an interesting war, and it was easily the best time of his life. Um, he regretted deeply when it ended. He regretted it personally. He didn't regret the fact that the war was over, but for him it was the end of a great adventure. Um, and he, he found it very difficult to come back to, to Oxford and to, to life in provincial England. He had lost his job, and the job wasn't there when he came back. I hadn't realised this, but a lot of people who had fought in the war were not guaranteed their positions when they came back, and he was one of those. And so on a whim, he decided to move to Australia. And this is him and his wife, Mildred, on the, on the ship sailing to Australia in 1951, when my mother was 10. And that's where they went to. They went from Oxford to Thumb Creek, which is near a place called Taylor's Arm, which is famous. It has that pub with, with no beer uh, 
There's nothing at Pub Creek either. There's no beer, there's nothing. And that was their house. Uh, and he was given a, a scythe, literally a scythe, and told to start cutting the grass. And that was the beginning of his Australian experience. My mother was placed on a horse. The horse was given a pat on the backside and she was told that there was three miles to school on her own. And in that moment, she made a decision. She said, I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm leaving this place. Uh, and she thought back to all of the places that they'd seen on the voyage over. They'd been to Cairo. They'd seen the Suez Canal. They'd seen um, Ceylon as a resident or Sri Lanka. Um, and she thought back to those places, this idea of a place. And she said, I'm going to all of those ports. Those are, the, those are my plot points in my life. She was only 10, but she'd made this decision already. In 1956, the family, uh, unhappy with life in Australia, did what many migrants did at the time and moved back to England. Uh, Harold was a restless person and the war had made him even more restless. He arrived back in England and realised immediately that it was the wrong decision uh, and they booked another passage back to Australia. This time full fare. You know, there was the, the, the assisted fares earlier, but this time it was full fare. And that's my mother there on the right crossing the equator uh, in, in 1957 when they made their way back. Uh, to Australia. She, she was taken again with the, the feeling of, of what it meant to visit places, to be somewhere different, that sort of intoxicating, almost addictive feeling that you can get if you travel a lot, that you keep needing novelty, that you keep needing the, the strange feeling of arriving in a place, waking up the next morning and going for that first walk outside the hotel, and all the, the buzz that you get from that feeling of, of novelty. And she became a little bit, I think, addicted to that feeling here she is at 15. And I think anyone who lives in an island knows that, that feeling. I touched on it in my introduction. But that feeling that you, you want to get away, that you're going to be reaching out for the rest of your life. In 1961, um, she joined the, the Australian Navy. And in, in the Navy, she met a, a, a dashing young Australian guy called Ed Reed. Um, and he was a, a radio operator, and he, he, was, he was very beardy. He had a, a large beard. He had slim legs and a strong jaw uh, underneath the beard. And, and he, was, uh, he was sort of funny, and he, he drew her out of herself. And they decided to get married. And they married, and because you, at the time marriage allowed you to, to step outside of your uh, commitments in the military, I'm not in, the, in the armed forces, I'm not sure if that's the case anymore, they left the Navy, and they began a life in a group of sort of ad Australian adventurers, um, this odd grouping that, uh, that just sort of took place. It was led by a guy called Warwick Decock, who started a, a company called Ausventure. He started Outward Bound School in Kangaroo Valley. And he also, in 1965, led an expedition to the Antarctic. And it was the expedition that was sponsored by Murdoch when the Australian newspaper started up. And it was a sort of a flagship ex exhibit, ex uh, Am I saying ex ex no, that's a expedition. expedition, thank you. Uh, a flagship <laughs> expedition for the Australian when it was begun. And mum was, mum was sort of married and involved in this group and became something of an adventurer. Um, it, gave her, it gave her the specific details of what it meant to want to leave. So she'd always wanted to leave, but suddenly she was in this group that just did. And I recently got chatting to Warwick, uh, who's now you know, quite old, and I was, I, was, I was talking about why it is that you would be an explorer. And he said, the great thing about uh, being an explorer is that you, you can never be lost because the whole point is to get lost. And, and if, you, if you're aiming to be lost, then that's, that's, that's the challenge. The challenge is actually getting lost. Um, the worst thing that can happen is that you get found. Uh, and, and I think that that's the, the mentality of this group, a sort of a they weren't hippies, they weren't new age, but they represented something that became very strong in the 1960s, which was the opportunity to lose yourself. And a lot of that had to do with landscape. In 1969, Ed um, fell in love with someone else, and he left uh, my mum for another, another woman. And she was sort of cut adrift then. She didn't quite know how to respond to that. Uh, but she did what she'd promised herself when she was 10, she decided to leave. And she left Australia for Russia, and she took the, on her own, she took the Trans-Siberian Railway. Um, she, she went all the way through, through the north of, of Europe and back to England, and ended up back in Oxford, that place where her father had, had lived, and got a job at a, at a psycho, 
at a psychology unit at Oxford University as a, as a typist. She then saw an ad in the Times, and the Times uh, classified, and it was an English secretary required, um, no tax. She rang up, it was in Iceland, and she thought, why not? Why not go to Iceland? The next day she told her boss at the psychology unit about this decision, and he took her into his, uh, his room, and he sat her down on the couch, and he asked her, are you mad? <laughs> um, now, coming from an Oxford academic psychologist, I suppose that was a technical question, uh, <laughs> rather than merely a question of, um, are you sure, you, have you thought this thing through? Uh, but she was a little bit mad to go to Iceland in, in that time. It was the end of 1969, and she was off. That picture's just there because it's pretty. <laughs> so I've got some dates there, and they're kind of the key dates in, in the first part of the memoir that I've, I've been working on. Um, in 1970, she arrives in Iceland, um, and she starts working in this company. It's a company of importers, and there's a man in there, a, a handsome man, um, that the girls talk about. He's sort of the flirty one in the office, um, the one who catches the girl's eyes, the one that you notice in the coffee room, the one who smiles um, unnecessarily. And she sort of uh, wondered about this guy and why he was paying her this, uh, this attention, but she didn't for a minute think it was directed particularly at her. She just thought it was his way of being with women. Uh, but one day she started following her home um, in a kind of, I guess, technically stalking uh, her. Uh, and, uh, and then on the second time that he followed her home, he started throwing snowballs uh, at her. Uh, and she said to him, why are you throwing snowballs at me? And of course the obvious answer that hadn't occurred to her was that he was, uh, had fallen for her. And they began to see each other, and they began a, a, an, aff an affair, a romance. Um, one day she asked him, why haven't you married? Why are you still single? And she said, and he said, well, I am married, of course. Um, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> um, and it turned out that he hadn't worn a ring because of, and here's a, here's a good, good uh, Icelandic excuse for not wearing your ring. Um, when, as he was a boy on a trawler, he'd seen a man's finger taken off. Uh, because of a ring that he'd been wearing. It was caught on something and just ripped his finger off. And he couldn't bear the thought of ever losing a finger, and so he didn't wear a ring. It was too late. Um, it was too late to pull out. She'd fallen for someone, and he was married. And they began an affair. And it was an affair that would last for seven years, and that would never be discovered. She, she was in love, and the, pro the product of that affair is, is your speaker today. Um, after, after a year and a little bit... Um, uh, she, she fell pregnant. She told him, um, and sh he put a, uh, he wrote down his blood group on a, on a piece of paper. He gave it to her, and he said, good luck. I don't ever want to see you again. Men. Um, <laughs> and so that was, as far as she knew it, he did say to her that he would, he would ask her not to ever reveal his identity as my father, and she agreed to that request. Nine months later, I was born, and, and in 1972, I was born, and he, he, he came back. He realised that she was good to her word. She wasn't going to reveal who he was. Uh, he realised that they had something special. They were, they were in love, and they decided, and, and they commenced, recommenced the affair. And it lasted for another five years until 1977, when Mum had more or less had enough of this situation, and she moved to Australia, to Sydney. In 1979, we moved back to Iceland, um, and that's when I met my father again. Um, in 1981, we left Iceland, oops, for England, where I spent four years in, a, in an English uh, institution, no, sorry, an English private school. Uh, and then, uh, and then in, in 1986, we came to Australia, and that was my, my mother's last migration. So she was back, uh, really, in, in the place where she'd promised to leave. And it's that, you know, toing and froing, of course, which is at the, at the heart of my interest in returning and leaving. Um, every time she goes to Iceland, she visits fairly regularly. She says, oh, this will be my last trip. But then, of course, she immediately starts planning another one. And I'm more or less the same. I can't ever quite give up on Iceland. This is Thingvellir again, uh, the, the side of the parliament, taken in winter. That's the lar largest lake in Iceland. It sits on the, on the edge of the, the National Assembly site there. It's also the deepest and coldest lake. Um, and sometimes if you go in winter, 
it's very hard to decide where the, where the, where the ground finishes and where the sky or the clouds begin. But there's always this kind of line, almost like a bookmark, running through the middle of it, and that's the lake. That's a photograph I took of a piece of ice that had, that had shaped itself out of the lapping of the lake, the gentle lapping of the lake, onto, onto the shore. In 1990, I, I started university at the University of Queensland, and in my first tutorial, um, this is just how sort of ridiculous life can be, the, the man who was taking the tutorial looked up from his role and said, Kauri, as in Kauri and Nelson. And he knew all the sagas, and he, he was instantly curious about who I was, and he said, are you from Iceland? And I said, yes. He said, well, you must do our Icelandic course. And believe it or not, up until quite recently, the University of Queensland ran two courses in Icelandic, in Icelandic literature and language. You could study all the sagas and you could learn the language. And so naturally I enrolled in, in, the, in the subject. I had something of an unfair advantage, it has to be said, but none of the other students were rude enough, or they were all kind enough not to point that out to me. Um, and I became obsessed with the literature, with these sagas that I was mentioning earlier. And actually what I started to do was going to return to Iceland, not through physical travel, but through a sense of, of this narrative belonging, that you could belong to a place through the stories that came out of that place. In 1999, I started a PhD in the subject, and I got a grant, and the grant was enough to take me to Iceland. It was the first trip I'd made in nine years, and I decided this time that I had to do something about this secret, this business about who my father was. And so I wrote to him, and I said, uh, Dear Gisli, I'm sorry, but the secret's over. So I was 27 at the time. It, it, the secret had lasted for 27 years. Iceland, which is a country where everyone knows everything, uh, no one knew who I was really, or who's, uh, who's father, who's, who my father was. Um, and then I wrote to my siblings. I wrote to my three half-sisters and my half-brother. And I, I gave my father a day. I don't know if that was enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I figured, you know, fair, fair enough. You know, he's had... He's had 27 years. He could have done something about this, but I will give him an extra day. Uh, and so I left a day between writing to him and writing to them, simply so that he had a chance to, to talk to them first if he wanted to. He didn't, um, but they were, they were wonderful. Um, the family responded in a way that I still can't quite believe. They, they, they decided they had a little committee meeting by phone uh, and decided that they would accept me that they would accept me, and not only accept me uh, as who I was, but that they would fully integrate me into the family, that it was not an option to not have a, f a brother in your life. If you knew you had a brother and you knew he was around, then there wasn't, there just wasn't the opportunity to say no. And so I think that's a very, very brave decision. And naturally, his wife, who, to whom he was still married, and who had no idea of any of this, uh, reacted a little bit differently but she too, in the first moments um, of my arrival, came up to me and said, you know, welcome to the family, which I think is an extraordinary act of self-possession and courage. So a new kind of returning began. Uh, it was a returning that, that existed through the, the sagas, these stories that I'd come to love, but it was also a returning that was very much centred on the notions of family and family and belonging and how those two are connected. In 2004, my wife and I travelled to Iceland uh, to try to live there. And we began in a, in a little village, a remote village in the northwest of the country. And in 2006, our first child, uh, Finn, was born in Iceland, born in the, the same wing of the hospital as I'd been born in. And at that point, the, you, I'm not a big fan of the idea of closure. I don't think that's such an interesting idea. But I suppose at that point, there was a certain circle that had been completed from my grandfather's restlessness and his decision to come to, to Australia and my return to Iceland and my, my becoming a father. And this idea of home started to actually mean something for me. And what it began to mean was the idea that you, you didn't always have a choice, that you had to kind of come back, that there was something inevitable about the return home uh, that always dragged you there. It's not quite the same as fate because it comes from within, but I think it feels like fate. It feels as though there are forces taking you back. This is Reykjavik, the capital, and that's Ayrshire, uh, a table mountain that sits uh, on the northern side of, of, uh, of the bay 
uh, new record. Is there a geography of happiness? Uh, can you find happiness in places if you can't find it in other ways? Do places give you the opportunity to define yourself differently? Can you, by moving out of your normal uh, context, your normal situation in life, uh, reinvent yourself or come to a better definition of something that already exists? My answer to that is yes. I think that traveling and uh, expanding beyond your normal world is actually one of the most economically efficient uh, and ways of doing that. Uh, you, you very quickly get to see who you are uh, because you're taken out of the context that you're used to. And I think most crucially, the people who you're used to hearing telling you who you are are no longer there. For a little while, you don't have anyone who knows your, your established nature and don't have anyone telling you what that is. And I think that can be incredibly liberating. So I think that there is a relationship between happiness and travelling. But what is home then? What, what does it mean to, 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 to need a home as well? And I think home comes to be defined uh, when we travel because we know that the experience of travel is temporary. Whereas the sensation that we have of home is, this, is the, the, the longer sense of ourselves that exists while we're travelling. And it's the conversation between those two things, the conversation between the, the immediacy, the novelty, the extremity of the travelling experience and the more enduring sense of, of a longer narrative uh, that marks the difference between travelling and exploration and return and home. One of the things that I love about being back, and for me being back is about being in two places, I come back to Australia and then I come back to Iceland. Uh, I have the two to come back to is that in both countries I, I have a sense of disappearing. Uh, and disappearing is, a, is, is equally I enjoyable as appearing, as sticking out. Uh, when we travel, we tend to stick out, or we feel we stick out because we, we're so out of place. And when we come back, we have a sense that there is no, there is no sort of identifiable, noticeable quality about us that's different. I'd like to finish my story about Halkev and Gunnar. Uh, Gunnar, remember, is the most outstanding warrior of his time, and Halkev is a little bit difficult with, uh, with fame. At least that's what the saga author tells us. Um, this is the site of his farm. This is Hlidarendur. This is a picture I took last year, looking over to Eyjafjallajökull, Jökull, uh, the, the volcano, the glacier volcano that went off. And that is a big, big cloud of ash. It was very windy that day, and the ash is, 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 is uh, being blown down the valley towards me. Two minutes after this photograph's taken, I have to actually flee uh, this site because it, the ash is becoming too dense to drive and the visibility was very, very low. I'd promised my son that I would collect some ash for him. Um, I said that I'd go to the volcano, I'll get you some ash and I'll bring you home. Uh, this was a very stupid promise to make <laughs> um, because on the day it was very windy and the only ash was in the air uh, and uh, my lungs were full of ash. Uh, but I couldn't find any ash. I, 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 can't quite, I still can't quite believe that I couldn't find the ash, but I drove around the whole damn thing and I didn't find a single piece of ash on the ground. And in the end, I had to buy the ash uh, from the duty-free shop at the <laughs> airport um, and, and bring it home in this ridiculous bottle that looks awfully like a test tube. Uh, I bought it. Uh, but he's happy with it, so all's well. I, I, I'm not, at some point, I'm going to have to confess that I did just buy it uh, at the airport. Um, this is... Uh, this is Hlidar Endur. So what happened to our, our friends Gunnar and Lida, uh, Gunnar and uh, Halkev? Well, they got married and they went back to Hlidar Endur, to Gunnar's farm, uh, and immediately there were, there were problems. Um, Halkev couldn't get along with anyone else. She couldn't get along with his uh, friends, uh, and there were all kinds of tensions. And during a period in which the farming community was suffering a, a drought, hard to believe in Iceland, I know, but it, it happened, they, they couldn't... Uh, there wasn't enough hay, and Gunnar asked his neighbours for hay, and they refused, and Halkev, in a, in a kind of moment of uh, obstinacy and pride, stole some chickens from the farm. Gunnar, when he found out, struck her. And she said to Gunnar, You'll never, I will remember that blow. Um, a little while later, uh, Gunnar started to fall into feuds with the surrounding farms as well. And his friend Yalt said to him, You must never kill twice in the same family. But if you do, you must do whatever we tell you. You must accept the settlement of men of goodwill 
And good knowledge said, of course I would do that. He did kill twice in the same family. And, good, uh, and now he organized for him to leave Iceland. He said, look, if you leave Iceland for three years, you'll live long and prosperous life. Good knowledge uh, agreed to go. And he began to ride down that slope. And this is the most accomplished warrior in his time. He tripped. The most unlikely thing happened. The horse tripped and threw him. And he looked back on the slopes of Hiverendil. And he said these three words. Vöver er hlýðin. It means the slope is beautiful. I won't leave. And he decided to stay. And it's no surprise, I suppose, that that has become a kind of enigmatic and, and highly, deeply symbolic uh, statement in Icelandic literature. But also for me, that this moment where Gunnar realized that there was no choice. Uh, and we don't really know why he decided to stay. He doesn't explain it. All he says is that the slopes are beautiful. Hiverend is beautiful. And he went back. A little while later, he was attacked. And uh, during the fight, he was keeping his enemies at bay with his bow. But eventually, it, the bowstring snapped. And uh, Gunnar turned to Hargez, who had that lovely long hair. And he said, uh, lend me some hair. And she said, does very much depend on it. Uh, and he said, well, I need it to repair my bow. My life depends on this. And she said, well, then let me remind you of that moment that you struck me. I refuse. <laughs> and that, I'm afraid, was the end of Gunnar. And that's the end of my uh, discussion today. Thank you very much. Oh, and a, and a plug. That's my book. It's coming out in August, uh, The Promise of Iceland. Well, that was fascinating. Uh, I suddenly feel so insular. <laughs> <laughs> I've been nowhere, done nothing. What a wonderful life story. Um, a life of stories, indeed. Um... We all have a sense of coming home, don't we, when we travel. Uh, you know, we do have uh, the excitement of going away. But there's something about uh, hitting what are your home shores as you fly in mm. that brings a sense of relief. How does that work for you, flying into Iceland as compared to uh, Australia? It's, uh, well, for me, uh, both Australia and, and, the, and Iceland are... Uh, are, are paradoxes when it comes to home because uh, in Iceland you, you fly into a, an airport just outside the capital called Keflavik and you come most often the flight path comes over Scotland and then you enter Iceland uh, airspace uh, from the south and it takes you over this uh, a vast lava desert it's entirely black and so your first sight of Iceland as you come in out of the clouds is is the silver of the North Atlantic um, meeting the intense blackness of the south coast of Iceland. And to me, I, I feel that that's an incredibly nostalgic moment for me. It's that recognition moment where I know I'm back. And also, of course, that, that, that first taste you get of the air that you recognise as your air. But then that's always matched for me by a kind of awareness that I've been away and that I've lost contact with a lot of things and that, that Iceland isn't entirely mine anymore. It's, um, it's essentially a, a site of imagination and dreaming as much as it is a, a kind of a real return or, or, mm. a, or, a, or a place of ultimate belonging. And the same in Australia. I, I come back to Australia and I know that this is actually where I live, where I have my family life and where, where my day-to-day -day existence is located. And yet I also know that there's, a, there's an element at which that dreaming isn't present. And so the, the, two, the, the, the two represent different sides of home mm. for me. Um, so Iceland's more like a sort of psychologically manufactured home. Uh, yeah, or, or a kind of, I always think of it as recognition. It's that, I don't know if, any, if it, this really makes sense, but to me it's the sense of rightness, like the things fit, like, yeah. you know, that I know how I am in the landscape. Yeah. Um, and that's not to say that being in Australia doesn't feel right, but it always feels ever so slightly foreign. So interesting. What reflections do you have like that? Have you had those sort of little moments where you've had... Uh, that rush of feeling of something warm and special about coming home to some place that's not necessarily your country, but some place that is meaningful to you. Is there something that Kari said that um, really struck a chord with you in the course of his 
delightful uh, presentation. Yes. After an absence, the first thing that struck me as soon as it came out of the airport was, I don't know, there was just something special in the in the light, something special in the the smells and the heat of Brisbane, and that's something that's always there as soon as I arrive in Brisbane is that sense of coming back to something that I've known and and uh, always enjoyed. Sometimes the atmospherics of a place are linked to a sort of defining experience there, mm. aren't they? Mm -hmm. The rediscovery of your father, did that, were there moments around those, that 24 hours that, uh, in a sense, uh, strengthened your connection with Iceland? There were, there were steps that I took that, su that I suppose told me a lot about how I related to the country um, and how you make the, the next step in your own life. Um, and often they're very mundane things. Um, for me, the most important fortification I got was from swimming. Uh, I happen to love the swimming pools in Iceland. They're, they're outdoor pools. They're heated ge by the geothermal energy mm -hmm. that comes in. There's a great many of them. There's 120 of these geothermal pools in a very small country. And they're a part of many Icelanders' daily routine. And as soon as I went back to Iceland on that particular visit, I started swimming again. And I would go to the swimming pool and I would begin to know the same people. You know, I'd be begin to recognise the old guys. And it's that sort of Scandinavian thing of um, everyone walking around in the change room naked and sort of talking, out, you know, and, and, and this sort of uh, feeling of comfortableness with your body. Um, that comes with that eventually. Um, maybe not. <laughs> uh, maybe not the first couple of visits uh, when you're talking to someone who who is uh, very naked in front of you. Um, but eventually, you forget about the, the the nudity and you just enjoy the the sensation of, of of freedom that comes from not wearing clothes and being in a warm room in an otherwise cold place. And they kept the the old guys um, kept saying to me, you know, who are you? Um, where are you from? There was this curiosity. And so when I say that there's this kind of desire in Iceland for people to know everything, I don't mean it's like a passive desire uh, to read things in the newspaper. People just come up to you and say, who are you? Uh, you know, and, then, and then, you know, where have you been? And I say, oh, I've been in Australia. They say, what are you doing there? That's a long way away. When are you coming back? You know, and almost as though you've been rude uh, by leaving and that every minute that you're away is a kind of insult to the country. Uh, and it was this, it was this interest and, and, and sense of you have to be here that persuaded me that I, I was right about it as well. You know, that the, these old guys knew something and then recognised something um, that I, I, I could then say, oh, yes, that's in me as well. So in terms of, like, is there something about the, the routine or the monotony of belonging? I think it's those little things, actually, that, that mark your, your sense of place because... Uh, I've talked a lot about big ideas like home and return and leaving. But th those big ideas only make sense in the routines of every day. The other thing I always do when I go back to Iceland is have a hot dog. And, and uh, I don't know why that's become such an important thing for me. But I, as soon as I get off the plane, I just have to get to the nearest hot dog stand. Uh, and it's, it's ridiculous because these hot dogs were brought over from America in the <laughs> Second <laughs> World War. Uh, nothing about there's Iceland nothing <laughs> Icelandic <laughs> about them at all. And they're covered in mustard and they're incredibly <laughs> bad for you. But for me, they... <coughs> Having a hot dog, standing somewhere freezing cold and having a hot dog. And I'm sure everyone has, you know, markers of belonging like this. But they're, they're, they're little things that signal your sense that you're back. So, comment up the back or question? Um, Carrie, I wanted to ask you um, about an idea you presented very early at the, the start of the talk um, about leaving as something that Australians and Icelanders have in common. Mm. And... Um, if you have a, an, an insight into the word for stupid in Icelandic, heimsku, <laughs> which I interpret as literally meaning boxed in at home. Yeah. Um, there's another thought I had about that as well with uh, the jokes I grew up with in Australia about stupid people. Usually they're Irish in those jokes, like mm. what's the latest Irish invention? <laughs>
um, in the United States, that's the same thing said about Polish people. While in Iceland, I learned that those stupid jokes are about people from a place in Iceland, uh, Hafnafjörður. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, Hafnafjörður is, is a bit like Redcliffe. It, it, um, um, it has Not Kimpy. Yeah. Well, it has the misfortune of being part of the city, but on the right on the edge of it. Oh, uh, okay. and, and, and so, for some reason, that's a sign of kind of lower evolutionary development um, <laughs> in, the, in the local imagination. Also, Hafnafjörður happens to be where you're almost guaranteed to be uh, uh, nearly killed if you go out there at night. And so, you know, this feeling of kind of danger and, and roughness that comes with certain kinds of towns. But that's a big part of the Icelandic nightlife is, you know, near-death experiences and total <laughs> kind of, um, you know, annihilated drunkenness. Uh, in terms of the, the, the business of, like, stupidity, um, you're right. I mean, the, one of the markers of intelligence in Iceland is preparedness to leave. You know, and that if you're not prepared to see beyond your shores, then you are in danger of being laughed at because you will think that Iceland is the only country that has, you know, toast. Uh, and because and, and you've never... And there is that tendency in Iceland for people to think that this is a uniquely Icelandic whatever, and which, you know, of course, it isn't. Uh, and so that, that sense of isolation is always going to produce that danger that you, you think there's something special about you. And Icelanders are already given to, prone to that. They're prone to a sense of their own uniqueness. Um, and so it's, it, is, it is important to get away in order to test uniqueness. One of the things that, um, that all Icelanders say, though, is that you can never not come back. And I think that, that is how they, they feel, in, in my experience, that is how they, they test uh, the uniqueness of Iceland. You go abroad, you see what's happening in England, you see, what's they go to England, America, and Denmark in particular, and then you come back with a, with a sort of renewed sense, a more sophisticated sense of what's different about Iceland. And I think that that is important in terms of intelligence. And I think that's the same here. You know, I think uh, most Australians that I know have felt it important to travel uh, because there is this perception that we're a long way away. Uh, one of the interesting things about that, of course, is that we're defining a long way away in terms of Europe. Uh, we have a perception of uh, Australia as a part, but it's a part. It's not. It's not it's really all that apart from its near neighbours. But culturally, and in terms of our, our sort of development as individuals, we feel that we have to go back um, to Europe. And I know that a lot's changed in the last twenty years around that, and that the the bright people don't all feel like they have like Clive Chambers, and so don't all, don't all, we don't all have to go to England to make it. But I still think there's a remnant of that in the way we think about travel, that you have to travel in order to be intelligent. Yeah. Perhaps with a slightly less strong imperative to actually come back compared yeah. to Iceland. Yes, yes, perhaps. Uh, a lot of people end up staying, don't they? I mm. mean, you think of Clive James and Jermaine Greer and Peter Conrad and so on. Those people left and stayed. Like and we don't Harris. think it's odd that they don't come back either, whereas no. in Iceland they think it's odd that someone doesn't come back. Yes, yes. Yeah. No, that's, that's a good point. Yes. Mm. Um, do you then become the person who um, shows them who they are as a family because you are then somehow part of the other and part of the other part of you? Is that, does that become your role in Iceland? Yeah, well, I think I, think I revealed... Um, of course, the first thing that an illegitimate child does to a family when he, when he or she turns up is reveal a reality that, that was not recognised before. You know, that the, so everything changes. The whole of the marriage changes uh, and is rewritten. So things like uh, working late suddenly has a completely different significance. Uh, distance becomes uh, redefined. So my father, my sisters tell me that I was, that he was a rather a distant man sometimes, uh, wanted to be left alone. And that distance is redefined. And then also the sense of kind of the, the nature of, of loyalty is, is, is re-examined by the family. What I found interesting about this particular family is that they didn't feel that key elements of what defined them have been challenged. So they didn't in any sense feel less love or less loved because of what had happened. Uh, and they saw that as extending to me. So the fact that, the, that, that their father had had an affair and had had a child just meant that there was an extra person to love 
And I, th I, d I don't know how typical that is. I think I was very lucky to, s to have th those people there waiting for me, if you like, uh, because I think a lot of people would perhaps have reacted against me as a threat to the love that had existed in the family before then. So um, in terms of my, my role, I think it's, it was more a case of that I, 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 I don't think I, I, I challenged their, their perceptions or, or how they were. Or I think it was more a case that I uh, brought out their goodwill. They had this extraordinary goodwill towards him as well, towards my father. Um, the, he, the first two or three days after I arrived, they had a family lunch. He was, he was there. Uh, his wife was there. The whole family was there. I was brought in. They set up this little stage for us to have a chat, which was kind of awkward. Uh, and then my two older sisters um, sort of hovered uh, while he and I chatted. Uh, and he had these strange questions he wanted to ask me. And then he said, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm in literary studies. And he said, oh, that's good. I said, why, why is that good? He said, well, you know, you, you know you're related to Snorri Sturluson. Snorri Sturluson. Oh, that author from 1241. Uh, uh, of, of course I am. And, 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 and we had this sort of strange conversation around these things. Um, but the whole time, like, even though there was a kind of, it, there was a kind of slight crowd car crash feel about the place, you know, that uh, this, this, uh, this thing had happened, no one quite knew what to do. But, uh, alongside it all was this enormous goodwill towards him. So, and that taught me a lot about him, you know, that he'd brought up and helped brought up, bring up children who weren't judgmental. Mm. So you sort of bring those judgmental people into the conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I guess uh, <laughs> I, 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 I was angry with him for a while, but I'm not anymore. And I mean, and, and my anger was uh, the anger of rejection. You know, it was just slightly different. You know, I just felt as though he hadn't wanted to be in my life. And so that, that produced a kind of a bitter taste. But by this point, I can say that it, it was actually at the point when I ceased to be angry that I was able to make contact with them. I think that, yes, yeah, but I take your point. I suspect every concealed child feels a little bit of that. Yes. Um, I think it's natural that you, 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 want, you want your parents in your life, and if they can't be in your life, then that, that's going to produce a frustration. Did you, um, when you uh, were, when you came to the moment of deciding to launch this assault on their <laughs> sensitivities. Uh, did, did it present you with a higher hurdle in making a decision about it or how you would do it uh, because of the fact that you were doing this in an, the Icelandic culture rather than the one you might have been more familiar with here? The thing about the funny or thing did you just charge in anyhow? <sighs> No, I, I, I was Hamlet. I, I was the, the delayer. It took me years and years to, bring, to get to this point. Okay. And I thought about it for a long time before I did it. Uh, and I planned the whole, you know, like I planned how I would do it. I was very, you know, sort of aware of the ethics of it. It's overly aware, I think. Mm. Um, and that held me back. But the, the, um, the situation in Iceland was, was odd in that um, my father, Gisli, was, was a very nervous uh, adulterer. Um, unusually... Now, I, I, that may sound like a tautology, but actually in the Icelandic context, very nervous because affairs are rather common. In, or perhaps not common, but rather more common than, than, than in other places perhaps. And it's not unusual to have families of half-brothers and sisters. And, and it's maybe it's the weather or the dark winters or something like that, but there's a lot of, there is a lot of that going on. Um, and, um, the Nordic idea, the yeah, Viking so it might be a idea Nordic of taking thing, a right. gift. <laughs> that's right. Um, <laughs> and the divorce rate is, is rather high. And, the, and, the, and, but, and so people in Iceland tend to have a kind of, if, if there's a child, it's always a good thing. That's the, the basic. And I think that comes from farm culture, that you, you always welcome children. But he was not like that. Uh, he, he was too nervous to, to share in that, that feeling. Uh, and I actually think... Um, that is a, a feeling that we should focus more on when these kind of uh, scandals arise. That, uh, that there's so much attention put onto the, the betrayal and not always enough attention given to the, the fact that th there's a good thing out of this, which is that there's a child in the world uh, and that's never a bad thing. In my, well, that's my view. Mm. I, I hope so. Mm. Any other reflections on Home and Away? Uh, wait, you might just wait for the mic because we're vodcasting. Is there a mic there? Thanks. Second last question. Uh, you're, oh, hello. 
Um, you s- said you have one son. Uh, uh, two. Uh, two. Uh, two. two. Okay. Uh, do they feel? Have they been to Iceland? And do they feel any sort of draw to it in the same way that you do as a home? Well, I uh, I indoctrinate them um, <laughs> uh, sort of remorselessly. Um, I tell them every night that you know the most important thing in their lives is Iceland, and they must never think. No, of course, I, I don't do any of those things. We we have a bunch of uh, Icelandic books um, and videos and so on. But my older son, who's old enough to start thinking about these things, um, he insists that we do English as well. You know, not just Icelandic. That's his saying. Not just in Icelandic projects. Um, but he's only coming up to five now, so they're not really at that stage yet where they're thinking in those terms. We, d- we went through a big Iceland phase during the volcano, and, and every night there was kind of talk about the volcano and, and how, how did it happen and, wh- you know, and those sort of things. Uh, but no, they're not... Uh, they're not yet at that stage where they're, they're thinking really about Iceland. Um, although I think the older one is, 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 is cu- very curious as much as anything else. Yeah. Last question over here. Uh, so what's your reaction to being asked... Uh, I'm sorry. What's your reaction to like being asked, uh, you know, do you have a hometown or where are you from? Because so many people can flippantly answer, oh, I'm from yep. here just so quickly in one word. Like yeah. Do you believe in having a hometown, or do you, you know, what what is your reaction to being asked that? It, it, it's a great question because it's it's, it's awkward. Um, wherever I go, I'm a little bit, you know, I'm straight away identified. I, I I'm quite convinced that I have an Australian accent when I speak English, uh, but people here tell me there's something else there. And the first thing people ask me is, "What's your accent?" Um, then, they, if they know my name, you know, they want to know about that. Um, and when I'm in Iceland, um, although my Icelandic is reasonable, I, c- I, w- I, I have a, an, I- an, a- an I- Australian accent when I speak Icelandic. Um, and so people there want to know where, where have you been sort of thing. And wh- you know, there's that sense that I speak Icelandic like someone who's been away. And so there is always uh, uh, this issue of where are you from. And you're right, it's, it's as though life itself is constantly reminding me of this, this thing. And I do get a little bit um, tired of it. I, I suppose... That the thing would be that I would quite like to be be able to say, yeah, I grew up in in Indrapilly and um, and and <laughs> went to grammar and and then went to UQ and then you know and then, and I actually find that a very attractive set of you know life pattern that that life pattern seems to be very attractive and actually something that I would quite like for for the boys for them to have that stability. <laughs> well, uh, I don't know about you, but. Um I found that uh, fascinating, Thank you. interesting, moving, insightful, uh, and indeed inspiring uh, discussion and presentation, delightfully articulated. Please congratulate Kauri on his presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your interest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us and uh, look forward to seeing you at the other sessions of the Ideas Festival.